All right. Well, the next point we'd like to discuss about the soul and how it operates is this point of resistance, the understanding resistance, what resistance of the soul is all about. Okay. Uh, tell me about resistance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lily. Okay. Well, let, let, let me read about resistance. Resistance is the principle that Truth enters the soul when there is no emotional impediment as error resisting the absorption of the truth. Error enters the soul when there is no emotional impediment as truth resisting the absorption of the error. Emotional impediments are under the control of the will of the individual in that the will can be exercised to emotionally release the reason for resistance. And this is a part of humility. So here what we're defining is sort of it's now, it's now putting together a lot of the principles that we've been talking about and determining, well, why do we become stagnant? Why do we stop progressing? What, what's the reason why progress you know, ebbs and flows? So we've, we've discussed already now the points about progression and what, what, what's going to be needed for progression. And that's the understanding that, that we need to do some emotional work that's going to be both painful and pleasurable in the process. And there's this issue of dominance that we, that we want, want, want to encourage the soul to be dominant, not suppress it. We want to encourage its emotions, not suppress them. And, and absorption states that we can't end, have a truth enter us unless some kind of error leaves. Now, if we put all that together, every single time we get into a state of resistance, basically what it's telling us is that there's an emotional thing inside of us that's causing the resistance. It's not some kind of uh, intellectual thing that we have to go through in order to stop resisting. There's some emotion, there's some kind of emotional impediment inside of our soul. And we're using our will to hold on to it. That's, that's the principle of resistance. We are exercising our free will, this gift, that, this beautiful, precious gift that God has given our soul. We're exercising it to shut down the painful experience. And if we exercise our soul to shut down a painful experience, we are going to be resistive to, to, to anything being absorbed into the soul. Now, we can be in error and resist truth, or we can be in truth and resist error. Either way, um, it's, uh, it's going to happen. And, and my suggestion is we use our will to always release error, right? And if we use our will to always release error, then we will never hit a point of resistance, right? We will never hit the point where we stagnate, where we, where we, where we slow down and stop in our progression. In actual practice, for the majority of people, we hit resistance all the time. We don't want to experience the pain of the, of the emotional error that exists in our soul. We want then to maintain intellectual dominance over our emotion. We want to avoid the process of absorption. We want to, you know, we also want to avoid progression. Now, of course, if we're avoiding all those things, the only subsequent result can be resistance, can be stagnation, can be stopping in our progress of the soul. And we need to understand the power of our will exercised in this regard. It's our will being exercised out of harmony with its design that causes us to go into stagnation. So whenever we feel stagnant or whenever we feel resistive to absorbing new truth, if we, were, if we thought about it and go, well, hang on a sec, this isn't very clever. <laughs> we're now using our will in complete disharmony with the way in which God created our, uh, the design of our soul. Why would we do that? That's such a silly thing to do. We'd be better off definitely changing that particular course of action. And, and I feel if we understand resistance is not about anything external. So in all of this, I haven't mentioned anything that's like your fault that I can't do something. <laughs> you know, it's not your fault or ego's fault or anybody's fault that I can't do anything. It's because of my choice to exercise my will out of harmony with God's original design that causes me to go into a place of stagnation. It's not because of anything you did. It's not because of anything you tried to stop me doing. Right? I might imagine it to be, but it's not. Right? The reality is I can use my will every single time. Every single time. To, to engage 
a place of non, no resistance. Now, if I understood that principle fully, I would probably find myself getting into less resistance, progressively less resistance as I went on. Because the more of that truth that I let enter my soul, the less I'd be tempted into resistance. Because I'd realise that there's a negative effect for any resistance. I'd realise that every time I resist something, all I am doing is working against the design of my own soul, which is not a very logical choice to make. Now, the only time when I feel that such a, a action is, um, is understandable is when we were children. Um, as you see, when we're children, we're often uh, put into situations that we cannot get out of. And, and as a result of that, we suppress certain emotions in order to cope with the situation. So, for example, sometimes as a child, we were smacked by our parents, right? Then we start crying. And then our parent tells us, if you cry anymore, I'll smack you again. Now, now that's a very confusing thing for the child because it's already experiencing the pain of the previous assault. And now it's being threatened with another assault for, for feeling the results of the previous one. Now, in that circumstance, the child will probably learn to close itself down, and that's understandable. But we're adult, when we're adults, that is not understandable to, to do that. There's no reason to make those choices as an adult. Even if violence is perpetrated towards us regularly, there's no reason to continue that because we, we as an adult, understand we have the power to release, and in fact, our soul has been created to release, and as long as I release, I am working in harmony with my soul's design. Whereas as a child, we don't understand that. Nobody's taught us that, so we don't understand that. But now that we understand this truth, we can at least work in harmony with its design as an adult. So I feel the only time when, uh, when, when the process of resistance is something that you can truly understand is when a child is in resistance, rather than an adult being in resistance. Unfortunately, we often find the reverse, and that is a child is rarely in resistance unless an adult <laughs> forces it into such, and an adult is often in resistance even when nobody is forcing them to do anything. So, um, you know, that's something that we do need to change. That's another error in the soul that needs to be released, this desire to, to, to stop the process of release. The child does not generally have a desire to stop the process of release unless it's received plenty of encouragement in that direction by its environment before that time. Whereas as an adult, living by itself or even with a partner has no reason to not release. There's no logical reason to not release. They are no longer being dominated in that circumstances by another, although they may have attracted somebody, maybe their partner who dominates them. But even so, there's still no reason to not release if they trusted the mechanism of the soul, if they trusted God's design. So if they trusted the fact that there's just one emotion they need to get rid of and then it'll all flow. Mm. It's just another feeling they have to feel. It's just another feeling. They wouldn't have this feeling of being afraid of their feelings all the time. They'd go, it's just another feeling. Even if it's fear or terror, it's just another feeling. All I need to do is release it and the error can leave me and then a new truth can enter me. I can grow if I allow this feeling to flow. And uh, they wouldn't worry so much about their feelings of what they would be. All they would do is use or exercise their mind in a loving direction to support their feeling. So they wouldn't dump their feeling on everyone around them all the time. They would, let, they would use their mind to support the processing of the feeling in a, in a way that wouldn't harm other people or themselves. That's what they would do. So they wouldn't even choose to harm themselves. They wouldn't choose to cut themselves up or hurt themselves in any way or bash themselves. They wouldn't choose to, you know, to suicide, which is, a, which is the ultimate of self-hurt, I suppose you say, or of self-rage. And they wouldn't choose to do any of those things because all of those things would be more out of harmony with love. They would choose just to feel the feeling, no matter how intense it is and no matter how painful it is, knowing that if I fully... Fit, if I fully express and experience this feeling, the error leaves me and now the truth can enter me and my life will change. Um, that's the beauty. So, so resistance, um, I suppose we could say resistance is futile. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but the reality is most of us don't believe that. 
Most of us believe that resistance is a powerful place. That we can avoid it, our pain forever, and it's not going to control our lives yeah. and everything that happens to us. But if I truly understood dominance, then I would also understand that resistance is futile. Because sooner or later, if, in, if there is error and pain in my soul, it's going to have to come out. It's going to come out one way or another. And I can either aid that process in a, in a, in a logical and coherent way. I can aid it, like use my mind to aid the process, or I can suppress the process and fight it for the rest of my existence, which means it's just going to take longer, that's all. I can do one or the other. Now, it's not very logical to make something take 10 years that could take one year. And it's not very logical to make something take a thousand years when it could have taken one year. And my suggestion is with resistance, notice when you're in resistance. You're in resistance every time you exercise your will to deny a painful experience. You're in resistance. And you'll also be denying pleasure in that place because the soul is not able to distinguish feelings between pain and pleasure and, and selectively feel them without using the mind. And we're saying the mind can no longer be dominant. What we're saying is the soul needs to be allowed to experience its thing. It needs to do its stuff. And the only way we're going to allow it to do its stuff is by allowing it to feel everything, which includes its pain and its pleasure. And if we try to shut down either, we are going to be creating a major problem for our soul in the future and a major problem in terms of our development of our soul. Our soul cannot develop while it's being shut down in one or the other or both directions. Yeah. So I'd encourage people to notice when they're resistive. Like quite often, you know, a person says, comes up and says to me, oh, I haven't done much progress in the last year and I'm not really sure why that is. I'm saying, why aren't you sure? You're obviously in resistance. You should be sure of what is creating your resistance. Like I know what's creating my resistance. Why don't you know what's creating so yours? So it's one or the other. Basically, you're in resistance or you're progressing. That's right. You're either resistant or you're progressing. There's no real, you know, there's no real middle state from those two places. You're either in progression and fully engaging progression or you're in resistance. And sometimes you can be in resistance on one issue and progressing on another. That is possible. But, but when it comes to each issue individually, you're either in resistance or you're in progression. Which one? You know, and, and my suggestion to people is at least know why you're in resistance. At least know. <laughs> don't, don't ignore it. Don't, don't try to make out that you're not when you are because nothing will happen then. If you make out that you're doing something that you're not doing, of course nothing can happen. So be real about it. I know that I'm resisting this issue. Work out why. Use your mind to find the reasons why you're in resistance to this issue and then allow, once you become aware of the emotions involved, allow the emotions to be processed so that you're no longer in resistance. The soul's natural state is to grow. It's like, again, we can do an analogy with nature. You plant a tree, it would make no sense to put a complete structure around the tree that would normally grow 30, 40, 50 metres high and to put a structure around the tree so the tree could only grow one metre high and then to do everything possible to stop the growth of the tree. But that's what we're doing with our souls. Our soul is made to grow. God designed it that way, to grow. To, uh, actually, God designed our soul to exponentially grow continuously infin at infinitum. That's how God created our soul. So it's not like our soul is limited to be 50 metres high. Our soul is, is not limited and not a limited creature if we receive divine love. So why would you choose to limit it? That can only be an error of some kind that would cause such a choice. So find it and release it. Don't live with it because while you're living it, you're, 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 you're putting structures around your soul to constrain it. And that's going to damage its development. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to ever resist, it, and particularly knowingly resist. I do that plenty. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, well, find the reason. My suggestion would be to find the reason why. What, what is it about growth that is challenging? Or what, why do you wish to resist? What is it? And for a lot of people, generally, it's the pain. It's the resistance 
the, it's the fear of pain, all right? Not understanding that pain is a healing process when you release it and experience pain, it's a healing process. Most people still resist pain. And, and as a result of that, they can't grow. You know, that, that's why they get resistive. They, many people I also find are not coping with overwhelm. They're not coping with being overwhelmed emotionally. To grow in its ex emotional expression, your soul must be overwhelmed. So that's how it gets stretched. It's, it's sort of like getting a balloon and deciding to not put any air in it, <laughs> which is what we often do with our soul. Our soul is made to stretch and expand, infinitely in fact. And, and yet many of us don't blow the air in to get that process started. We're not, we're not assisting the process. We're afraid of its growth as much as we're afraid of it shrinking. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes no logical sense either, if you think about it, because our soul is designed to grow. So, so while I'm restricting it, I am working or attempting to work against its own design, the, what God has put into it, the design that God has made. So it makes sense instead to start filling it with air, you know, filling it with something. And to make it to help it grow, and to grow, it's going to have to stretch. It's going to have to stretch, and in fact, as we receive divine love, we stretch even beyond our original capacity to stretch. Uh, that's how God created our soul; that we can be turned into a new divine creature through the reception of divine love. So we need to allow for the fact that we're going to not only stretch to what we were originally created to be. But we can also stretch beyond that capacity infinitely. Now, that can't happen if I'm resistive to being overwhelmed. If I'm, if I'm constantly going, I don't want to get overwhelmed. I want to receive a new truth, but I don't want to be overwhelmed by it. And, I, and I'm timid with regard to the reception of new truth in that regard. Then what's going to happen is uh, I'll be constantly resisting progression. So I'll be in resistance most of the time. That makes no sense at all. We're working against our design, the design of our soul when we're in resistance. It is far better to understand the principles of resistance and go, okay, there it is again, I'm in resistance. <laughs> Find out why. Use your will to discover why. Use your will in a positive direction to assist your soul in its growth. Mm -hmm. So should we, can we um, use the example again? Sure, yeah, the resistance? same example same of violence. Example. Yeah. So yep. the truth was that violence towards anyone is not loving mm -hmm. and the error is that that person has made me angry so violence towards them is justified. Okay, now we're looking at this principle with respect to resistance. So what we're saying here now is that the person who's thinking these things is resistive to letting go of the error that violence is justified. So that's what they'd be doing. They'd be saying, I don't see any point in letting go of this. The truth is that there are times when violence is justified. And the truth is, if, you, if your child was being hurt, you would revert to violence. I know you would, you know, and they come up with all these ex arguments, which is just basically an expression of their rage of accepting the truth that violence is never justified. Now, while they are expressing their rage of accepting the truth, they're never going to release the error. The error is still going to remain within them. Whatever the error is that causes them to think that way is going to remain for good unless they have less resistance to accepting the, 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 the need to release the error. So, so it's one thing to acknowledge this is how I feel. It's quite another thing to justify holding on to it. All right? So it's one thing for me to acknowledge, yes, I do have emotions in me where I do feel violence is justified under certain, okay, under certain conditions. That's one thing. It's quite another thing to justify the, the reasons for my holding on to those particular emotions. Right? And what I'm suggesting is a person in resistance will justify holding on to the error. And, and it's unjustifiable. There's no logical reason for doing it. And, but, but obviously they believe there is one, but there is no. There is no logical reason for holding on to such an error. Now, a person who wants to overcome resistance would use their will instead to go, wow, I really want to hold on to this error. 
Like I really want to hold on to it. I, I really want it to be the truth. I, I want to believe that there's times when violence is justified. And then if they allowed themselves to think about that and use their mind and their will to find out the reasons why, they would soon come to the conclusions of why they want to believe that. And there'll be all sorts of emotions involved in that, right the way through to unjust, unjust things that happened in their past that they would really like to get the person back for what happened to them in the past. There, there'd be unreleased hurt about the unjust things that have happened in their past that causes them to feel that way. There might be unreleased hurt about sexual matters such as sexual abuse and, and rape and those kind of issues. There might be unreleased emotional hurt about violence, you know, that, that has been perpetrated towards them. Towards them. And, and if they were truly honest about that and wanted to get out of resistance, they'd be willing to go to those emotions. Yep. If not, they will continually justify their position. And, and this is what I find happening quite regularly with people in resistance. You know, they, they come up to you and they say, I'm in resistance. And you go, OK. No worries. Well, there's no problem being in resistance. That's not the problem. The problem is wanting to stay there. <laughs> That's the problem. So what are you in resistance about? And they say, oh, well, I'm in resistance about the fact that, you know, I don't want to accept that I've treated my children badly. I go, OK. Well, how are your children treating you now? Oh, well, they're not very happy with me, actually. They all feel like I've treated them badly, right? OK. Um, so you're resistive to acknowledging that fact. And how's it working out with your relationship with your children? Well, not very good, obviously, right? Because they'll be feeling one thing and you're, you're acting another. Not very, not very good. So why do you want to hold on to this? Why, why do you want to hold on to this concept, this, this concept that it's justified that you treated them badly? Or that you even don't think you've treated them badly at all, you're in complete denial. Why do you want to hold on to this? When it's being reflected to you in the course of your day through God's law of attraction, it's being reflected to you all the time. Why do you want to hold on to that concept? And oftentimes they'll get down to the feelings of guilt and shame they have and other different emotions if, they, if they're willing. If they're not willing, they'll fight. Well, I, got, you know, I only knew what I only knew then and I, you know, I know better now, of course. And, but, but back then I didn't know better and, and I, can't, I shouldn't be blamed for things that I didn't know. And the, Now all of their errors are coming out. Their unwillingness to take personal responsibility for actions they've taken in their life that were based around an ignorant position, for example, which is, which is part of the error that they've just expressed. And they are unwilling to accept these errors, that they are actually errors within them still, that stop them from accepting the truth. And so my suggestion would, to them would be choose differently. Use your will, choose differently. Choose to see the error, choose to acknowledge it, choose to firstly intellectually acknowledge it, but, for, but secondly feel it, feel the error. And a lot of it is about repentance. A lot of it is about a person's resistance to repentance. You see, we are very happy to acknowledge that somebody else done something to us. Usually we're quite happy about that. <laughs> we're not so happy to forgive them because we feel that that's letting them off the hook for what they've done. So we're not happy about that. But when it comes to our re being sorry for what we have done to others, the majority of people have huge resistance to that. And that is usually the com most common cause of resistance in our soul. The most common reason for us to not progress is because we don't want to acknowledge what we have done. So it's, <clears throat> it's sort of like not taking personal responsibility exactly. for everything in our soul. And, and not taking responsibility for the fact that not only have we created pain in our own soul, but we've also created pain in, the other, in other souls as a result of our choices and decisions. Now, if I understood resistance and I didn't ever want to get into resistance and I understood progression, I'd be willing to go through the process of repentance. I'd be willing to work out the reasons why I chose to take such actions that I chose that obviously harmed others and myself. I'd be willing to look at those particular things. So I would not be willing to stay in a state of resistance. But, but if I don't honour my soul and I don't honour what God has created, I may stay in states of resistance for thousands of years. And in fact, in the spirit world, the main reason why people do not progress 
has nothing to do with belief systems. It has everything to do with their unwillingness to repent and forgive. That's the main reason why people stay stagnant for thousands of years in their soul progression. It's not even because of the way they exercise their mind. It's because of their unwillingness to feel specific emotions of repentance and forgiveness in particular that cause them to, to not be able to progress. So if we understood resistance and we understood progression in the soul, we'd be pretty resistive to uh, you know, holding back our own progression. In other words, we, 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 whenever, whenever we felt inclined to be resistive, we'd be looking very carefully, like with a magnifying glass, at the reason why we're trying to be resistive instead of just trying to brush over it all the time and make it go away and try to justify it and minimise it and shift the blame to somebody else, we'd be constantly on the lookout for our points of resistance because it's our points of resistance that will eventually prevent our relationship with God. It's not going to be the truths we accept that prevent our relationship with God. It's going to be the errors that we're unwilling to release that cause the injury to our relationship with God and also cause the injury to our relationship with ourselves and, and our friends and, and partner and children and everyone else in our life. It is our resistance that is going to cause that damage. So my suggestion to people is understand resistance. Understand your will is being exercised to shut down this process, to shut down the process of absorption, to shut down the process of understanding how progression occurs in the soul. And, and use your will differently. Actively choose to use it differently. And use your mind, instead of using your mind to deny you've ever done anything wrong and using your mind to deny that something is wrong or using your mind to minimise it or shift the blame onto somebody else or take, and not take responsibility yourself, use your mind in a completely different direction to aid your soul's progression, not to limit it or inhibit your soul's progression. Yep. And I feel that if people understood the principle of resistance, they would, never re they, would, they would never get into periods of resistance. They'll get into moments of resistance, you know, maybe for a day or two, or two maybe. Uh, but they would never get into periods that last years and years and years of their life of resistance if they understood the damage that it does to the progression of their soul. Mm. Yeah. You had a question? Uh, I was just going to say, and the resistances can be reason upon reason upon reason upon reason upon reason. Of course. Uh, often they are <coughs> constructed in layers. Um, and remember that resistance is about emotional impediments. So it's emotional reason upon emotional reason upon emotional reason. Yeah. It's not just intellectual argument. It's every one of these intellectual arguments comes from an emotional impediment, from an emotional reason why we're arguing for the error. So, so when I see people arguing for the error, that is a direct indication that they want to hold on to resistance. Of course, you're going to harm your own soul holding on to resistance and harm the soul of others while you're holding on to resistance. And understand that your resistance is caused by the emotional desire to hold on to the impediment that is causing the resistance to truth. So, so why would you want to exercise your emotions in that, in that direction? Feel the emotional reason why instead. So, so, for example, you might get down to the fact, for example, that you don't want to tell the truth in all situations because you're just scared of people and what they'll do. <laughs> so instead of going into resistance and justifying, well, they'll attack me and they'll do this and they'll do that to me and they'll just make my life a misery if I tell the truth, so I'm better off not telling the truth. That's all just justification of the error. That's justification of you holding on to the emotional impediment. How about using your mind in the completely opposite direction and say, there is no justification to me holding on to this emotional impediment and let myself feel that they will hurt me and feel that they will attack me and feel that my life will be and go through the feelings of that because they're obviously in me. That's, what, that, that's the impediment that's causing the resistance, right? 
So understand that it's the emotional impediment and I need to feel the emotional impediment. So feel my anger at the fact that they'll attack me and feel my anger at the fact that they'll hurt me and, and all these kind of things and let myself release the feelings and get down to the grief that's underneath them to the point where I've released it. And I go, well, I don't believe that anymore. <laughs> you know, I don't believe anymore that if I tell the truth, I'm going to be hurt all the time. Now, I said to Mary recently that myself and Mary live in different worlds when it comes to the truth because, because I know that telling the truth all the time will always benefit me and everyone around me and I feel it all the time. It's, a, it's directly reflected to me all the time. We, I have wonderful conversations with people where they connect to the truth and they go away feeling changed, you know. Mary has the opposite occurring all right, many of the time, much of the time because she's afraid of people and how they'll react to the truth, right? And as a result of that, she, she's, she's sometimes, up until quite recently, was justifying not telling the truth. And now she's working through the emotional impediment to doing that, which is her fear of people's violent, abusive reaction. Right? So feel the fear of their violent, abusive reaction. Once you've released that emotional impediment to telling the truth, you will have no resistance to telling the truth. It'll just be a natural process because you've released the emotional impediment that creates the resistance. And that's what we need to understand when it comes to resistance. Mm. Okay. Yep, that's Thanks. good. Thanks for that discussion, Liddy. We'll move on to our next. <laughs> like, what I'm finding with logic, emotions and truth is that the emotions inside people just prevent them from being logical. They can't think clearly. And it was interesting, I was talking to, I think Mary recorded that actually. We talked to a group of spirits about logic. And, um, oh, the atheist one. Yeah, yeah. And, and they, they were saying how it's very unusual to find a person who's emotional, who's logical. And they couldn't understand why I was so logical. Because, because it, I wasn't logical through the exercise of my intellect like they were. Yeah. Yeah. And I do find that people do struggle when I enter into a logical discussion of a subject. Do you know, do you know what I mean? They really struggle with the logic. Sometimes yeah. it can seem a bit conceptual until you put on... That's where I put struggle, in, I think. Uh, put it into an into example. Into an analogy or some kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it can be a bit like... Oh, I guess because you're not going... Oh, you're going... Oh, from yourself, right? So, yeah, no. It sort yeah. of... It, it sort of feels to me sometimes like there's thousands of subjects and sometimes when I choose an analogy, it feels a bit lame in comparison to the topic, you know? Oh. And so, yeah. I feel the logic, you can't contradict it, you know? I mean, you say it. Well, the People can't, can't challenge you on that and they feel... Well, they can, but they, they use. They're riddled with fear. But they use illogical argument to counter the logic. But that's the thing. Like that yeah. conversation yeah. I had with my neighbour, who just went on and on and on and on and on about me being in a cult. And I was like, on and on. <laughs> like I said so many things, and he was just convinced that you know I just wasn't advanced enough to have all the nasty things happen to me that happened to him when he joined some group and. Um, <laughs> And had these, you know, spirit attack. And he felt like spirits were climbing up his abdomen and stuff. Oh. Like, I know. Yeah. And he was like, "Oh, you're just not advanced enough yet. It's going to happen to you." And I was like, "It's really, it's not. <laughs> it's really not." <laughs> and just, oh, it was just, it was just a circular. Like no matter what I said, it was, it was never going to change yeah. his mind. Because because a person who's embroiled in their unhealed emotion is incapable of being logical. Yeah. The so truth can't enter them. Riddled with fear. Yeah. And if yeah. you're, you're riddled with the emotional impediment, you can't accept any... Like, it, you know, sometimes when I'm giving a discussion or a talk with people and I come up one example and I just feel the audience totally blocked to that, so I come up with another example, the audience totally blocked to that. Come up. And all I'm trying to do is look for, emotion, it, it, look for examples that I can feel in the audience where there's going to be some emotional openness. Does that make sense? Like... And there is sometimes an example that you can come up. And I know that once I'm at one, we've got to be able to go, I know the exact example that's going to create, if anything's going to create emotional openness, this is going to be the example. Because you, you know what feel Because you can feel everybody and collectively. And it's hard in a group because obviously everyone has their own emotional impediment. So, so we can include this in the discussion, actually. 
the emotional impediments are interesting. You, the resistances are interesting because the emotional impediments are sort of like, they're like doorways in the soul, you could think of them as. And it's sort of like the door is closed, the door is closed, the door is closed. Like, and until some opening occurs on that particular front, that door is never going to open. But there might be a slightly variant truth that you can present where there's a door slightly open in the same soul on a, on a, on a, on a related subject. And you might, so you might use one analogy and the doors totally closed and they don't even get it, the analogy at all. And then you use another analogy and the doors totally closed to that analogy because they don't get an, that analogy at all because of their emotional impediments. But then there's this third analogy that where the door, because they've had a bit of emotional processing where they've released a bit of error or no error entered them on a particular subject and the door slightly open. Now when you say the third thing, you go, oh, they go, oh, oh, I know what you mean now. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> I had that one yesterday. Something you said to me. Oh, yeah. now I get now it. Now I get it. <laughs> like, and that, and that's because the uh, with this I- issue of resistance, the, there's the resistance, the emotional impediment creating a resistance, and there's an unwillingness to address the emotional impediment or even know what it is in most cases, and then unwillingness, unwilling, and then all of a sudden you hit one that's actually open, like a door that's partly ajar, you know, and, and straight away there's a connection. And that's the beauty of understanding absorption is that when you understand that you've got part openness in a certain location, you won't bother having a conversation with a person unless they're partly open in a certain location. In other words, you know, so the example you just gave of the man who w- wanted to try to convince you you're in a cult and you're telling him, I'm not a cult, I don't have any of those experiences. He's had a lot of bad experiences which are driving his emotions about it all, of course. But, and we've got to acknowledge that. And in fact, in, if you acknowledge that, you might have got further with him. That you've had a lot of bad experiences, and I oh, understand I the emotion. Yeah, it so didn't I, work. No, that, that didn't work. So, 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 you know, that door wasn't open either. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so, he's trying to try to convince you you're going to have the same experience through, you know, and and of course it's not possible, but he's going to try to convince you of such. And unless there's a door open somewhere in this discussion around that particular subject where there is a point of entry where, you, where a thought that you are presenting as truth can actually enter his soul, he will not be able to accept any of it. So, so nothing will ever be absorbed. So, and what I find under those circumstances that it, it's basically totally useless having a conversation with that person. On I, that subject. I reached that conclusion at yeah. the end because yeah. in the end he, he'd reached the conclusion that everything in, on the planet, any form of spirituality was evil yeah. and corrupt and they're yeah. all like in this big conspiracy theory yeah. and the only thing that was safe was Christianity. Yeah. So then I started talking about some of the flaws in that yeah. and I didn't get anywhere there. I was like, okay, <laughs> bye. <laughs> I give up. I give up totally yeah. now. Exactly. Yeah. There were no holes in anywhere to him. There were, there were only emotional impediments, only resistance in every course of action. And, and so what... What you find after a while, the more sensitive you become at in your own soul, is you instantly feel whether there is an openness in the person in any direction. And you are able to engage that openness instantly by saying the right words and leading them down a certain path instantly. And if there is no emotional openness in any direction with regard to truth, then you won't even bother engaging the conversation because it's pointless. It's just pointless. Nothing you do, nothing you say will actually change that person's mind. Even nothing you do, even if you love them to bits, they're not going to change their mind Like because the emotional impediments prevent them from doing so. And this is where I feel, you know, if you understand resistance in yourself and you start understanding resistance in other people, what eventually happens is you know which conversations to engage and which conversations to just walk away from. Because, it, because it's pointless in wasting your time on conversations where there is no emotional openness, only resistance in every direction you take. Yeah. And it's interesting how people will often ask a question with no desire at all to have it be emotionally open to the answer. Yeah. And that after a while you start feeling that as well, that it's pointless addressing the question, as answering the actual question you need to firstly address the reason why they're not emotionally open to the question, the answer to the question. So they're just asking a question for another motive. 
Yeah, like many members of the media, for example, have asked me questions only to make statements. So they're really just oh, making okay. statements of their own by yeah. asking a question. They don't want or expect or even encourage me to answer it or give me the time to answer it because they don't have any interest in hearing the answer. They only have an interest in hearing the question. Yeah, I watched one of the recent <laughs> ones recently that was a bit like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and many people are like that, where they, there is no ultimate desire to know the answer to any of the questions they're asking. They're only asking the question because they want to be able to say, I asked that question and he couldn't answer it. You know, like that's all that they want to say. Um, and, it's, and, and they remind me a lot of the Pharisees in the first century to, in that regard. That, that was the purpose of the Pharisees questioning. They always had an ulterior motive to their questions. And, uh, and a person who's got ulterior motives to their questions is never going to be self-reflective and they're never going to be able to grow their soul. They're constantly in resistance. So my suggestion to anybody who wants to share truth with others is, you know, feel the soul of the person, feel where they're emotionally open and engage conversation in that direction. And uh, usually a person, a, a sincere person, is generally emotionally open in some direction, you know, of some kind. Um, but as you know, there are times when you find a person who's not emotionally in any direction at all except for something physical, you know. In, in other words, they're not emotionally open to any spiritual conversation or, or, or direction of truth that you could take, mm. which is sad for them. Yeah.